I have uh, Jimmy Halligan on my left, who's vice chair. Then we have Kieran McCarthy, chairman, Colin Barry, and to my right, um, John Hennessy. Now, before we begin, um, we didn't have a chance because of the present situation in the country, but we would like to remember our great friend and comrade, uh, John Jeffries, who was an enormous help to us, helped to us right through the years with our committee. May he rest in peace. Also, we remember Raymond Barry, another valued member of our committee and brother of Colin. So we're here to commemorate the changing of the name of Co from Queenstown, which happened on the 2nd of July 1920, down in the local council office, which is now the library, where that famous vote was taken. It was a momentous occasion. It had followed on from the local elections of 1919-1920, um, Sinn Féin again had won a landslide, 560 seats, Labour had uh, something like 394, so we had Republican majorities. One of the first things that they did um, was to go into the council chamber and um, take that historic vote. Kieran McCarthy, our chairman, will bring you through the events of that day and how that vote came about. Now, I would like to point out that um, some people think it may have been railroaded through by the Republicans, but this is not the case, because if you look at the fact that in April, that same council voted by 12, um, uh, 12 in favour, one um, abstained to show, to the, um, pass the motion of allegiance to Doyle Airden, where they were already ignoring any British um, power. So that's how it happened on that day, and that, those elections themselves were very, very uh, important. It was the first and only time on a six-county basis that PR was used in Ireland. Um, it had been used as a trial in 1919 in the Sligo elections. So I now leave Cairn to tell you the story. Thank you. Thanks, Paul, and welcome everybody on this very historic day, a hundred years ago today, the town changed its name. But that's not the full story, because 71 years before that, it changed its name again. And I'd like to point out and go through with you the contrast between those two events. In 1849, with the arrival of Queen Victoria into the town. Now, as a town, let's take a look and just try and understand and imagine what it must have been like in the run-up to that where the decision was taken to invite the Queen here in the first place. Now, Cove, back then, and it was spelled C-O-V-E, was a very busy port because we were in the last year of the last bad year of the famine. So in this port, you, you would have thousands of people leaving every day, trying to make their way across the Atlantic to America and Britain and different places to make a better life for themselves. A lot of those people didn't make it to the other side because they were already too far gone with the hunger and disease. And the disease they suffered with was typhus. And that thrived in confined spaces, so you can imagine the overcrowding in the ships. There was a lot of people buried at sea. Hence the name Coffin Ships. Now the people of this port weren't as badly affected by the famine as everywhere else because they had access to the sea and they were, it was kind of in a way it was a semi-prosperous town because of the, all the emigration. But the ordinary families, the workers, the people working on the dockside, the Keys, would have witnessed all that misery. They would have also witnessed their fellow countrymen and women being taken across the harbour to Spike Island, where they awaited for transportation to the colonies. Now, in that background, is it very likely the people of Cove would have invited the British Queen here in the height of all that misery? I don't think they did. What you had was a small minority who took it upon themselves to invite the Queen. They would have been mainly the affluent, unionist and military classes, a minority in the town. Okay, they learned that the Queen was coming to Ireland, she was meant to visit Muckra's house in Killarney, and they decided to get in on the act and they invited the Queen. But before that, one report, I remember reading the report back in the 1970s in the Evening Echo, and it quoted an article from a previous newspaper around the time, which said there was a public meeting held along the beach, in the premises along the beach, where those organising the visit for the Queen uh, 
try to do it or try to give the impression they were doing it democratically, but it was an open public meeting and they didn't count on a lot of ordinary people turning up, people of the lower classes who objected and didn't want the Queen coming here. And they